Thanks. So yeah, welcome back. Uh, thanks for enduring. Um, so we're going to talk again about quantum chaos today. And today will be similar in format to last time. So I'll be at the board for a little bit first, and then I'll show you a lot of data. And the focus um, for today is what I call short time chaos. So chaos on times of order one up to, say, system size scaling time, but, but shorter than exponential time. And I want to remind you that the perspective we had yesterday was in terms of chaos as, a, as essentially a process of the effective loss of information or the generation of entropy. And, you know, as I said, this is, this is a perspective. I'm not claiming this is the definition of quantum chaos. That's actually still something very in flux. In fact, I looked up on Wikipedia yesterday just for fun how they define quantum chaos. And it's defined as the branch of physics that studies how classical chaos emerges from quantum mechanics, which seems very wrong um, or very incomplete. And that's certainly not what I'm interested in in this series of lectures. So if Wikipedia gets it wrong, that must mean humanity is confused about the subject or we're very lazy. Um, so our perspective in terms of a sort of information loss, and this kind of, I think, resonates with, you know, sometimes classical chaos has been called deterministic randomness. Or Lorenz said it this way. He said, chaos in a chaotic system, the past predicts the future, but the approximate past does not predict the approximate future. So if you have some uncertainty, if you're a little bit unsure, if you look away for only a moment, then you have no idea what happened. You could be anywhere. So that's going to be our perspective still. And I want to emphasize, maybe I didn't emphasize this strongly enough last time, I'm not claiming that the world breaks up into chaos and non-chaos. We really don't know, especially in the quantum setting, what the different possible behaviors of a quantum many-body system are. It could be that it's essentially chaotic and integrable. It could be there are all kinds of other different universality classes of dynamics where you have some kind of partial chaos at early times or late times. So the, the, the space of possibilities, as far as I'm concerned, is pretty open. And so we'll continue to talk about sort of what you might call strong chaos, where everything is thermalizing, all the information that you can generate is being generated, and um, the system is sort of as chaotic as, you, as it can be in, in various possible ways. Okay, so, so recall last time we were considering uh, the spin chain model. with open boundary conditions. Which I called the power law quantumizing model. This. And uh, last time we, we, we looked at the classical version of this spin chain to see some of the manifestations of classical chaos that we might try to emulate or understand how they're reflected in, in a quantum many-body system. We also looked at the dynamics of information at early times in this spin chain for small sizes, and we saw that, that information which was initially localized, say, if, if two states differed on one site, then at a later time that information was spread out over the whole system. And the information actually was sort of spreading kind of ballistically. So what we're going to do today is talk about this model again, but we're going to talk about the operator dynamics of it now. Instead of the state sort of Schrodinger picture, we're going to talk about a Heisenberg picture of the chaos in this model. And then I'm also going to talk about a little bit later, a non-local model to explain to you how the time scales differ between these two cases. And then we'll again go back to the, the data. I'll show you a lot of um, plots of how these different operator diagnostics um, function in these two different cases. So today is out of time order correlator day for those of you who you know, want to reason by buzzword. So let's start out with operator dynamics. So the thing we're sort of looking for today is, is something roughly like um, we're sort of looking we're sort of looking for the butterfly effect. 
that's what I take to be sort of the, the meaning of this early time regime. And um, to, to look for this, actually a, re a really nice um, thing to look at is just the Heisenberg operator. So why is that? Let's remind ourselves first of all of the classical picture. Classical chaos, I have the following picture. I have some point in phase space and I have a trajectory and that trajectory follows <coughs> some path like that. And then I can consider a very nearby point where I make a small, a small deformation, right? So this is, this is path one. And then I make a small deformation of the initial condition to a nearby path. And that trajectory goes off in some totally different way. And one can measure the deviation if this is sort of delta x, this is delta x e to the lambda t. And we actually saw, we sort of saw in the spin chain, the classical spin chain, a separation like this. Okay, now this is like comparing trajectories of two different points starting at the same place. But you could, you could get the same physics by doing the following thing. Imagine you start here, or say, you know, and you go in the reverse direction here, then you make a small shift, and then you try to go forward again. Or equivalently, you go forward, make a small perturbation, then try to go back. That would be the, 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 an equivalent, because I'm still comparing the same two final points. So you mean two phase-based dimensions? Oh, two space dimensions. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm sure. Classically, certainly, I mean. Like a, I mean, like a Lorenz gas, for example, particle moving, and, or a hard sphere gas would do this. No, no, a two-dimensional gas. For, for example. Okay. So there is an equivalent version. Physically, where I go forward in time, I make a small perturbation, and then I try to go backwards in time, and I see how far away I am from the initial point. And that's sort of an equivalent measure. And so, what's nice about the Heisenberg operator, so now let's go to the quantum case. If I look at the Heisenberg operator, W of t, we all know its definition is very simple. I just conjugate the sum operator W with time evolution on either side. But now you see it has exactly this interpretation, where first I go forward, then I do something and then I go back. So this is some forward evolution here. This is a perturbation. And this is backward evolution. So in particular, if W was identity, then these would simply cancel and you'd get nothing. And if W is a simple operator, if it's say one spin or a few spins, then you'll get some approximate cancellation between the two time evolution operators. But eventually that cancellation will go away and, and things will continue to spread. So this Heisenberg operator is sort of really actually a picture. It's like a quantum version of this, this sort of, um, you know, butterfly effect where I go forward, I perturb, and then I try to come back. And so it's sort of not surprising that in the same way that this difference between initial and final state grows with time, one also expects something like the Heisenberg operator will grow in complexity in some sense as time evolves in a chaotic system. So the main idea is 
is w of t grows, I'll make more precise what I mean by that, grows in, in, in complexity, say, as t increases in a chaotic system. Now, I'll mention at this point um, two related measures of, which are trying to capture similar kind of physics to this butterfly effect physics, which collectively go by the name of uh, Loeschmidt echoes. So there are various notions of echo. One of them, going back to Perez, is to imagine the following thing. I take a state psi. I go forward in time with some Hamiltonian H1, and I go backwards in time with another Hamiltonian H2, and I square it and compute the overlap like that. And so, okay, this is, this is like saying I either taking a state going forward in time, then backward in time and comparing them, seeing if I get back to the same point, or I could just think of it as comparing two states where I have different time evolutions. And you might think that if, say, H1 is chaotic and H2 differs from H1 by some relatively small perturbation, then this might decay rapidly in some sense, even if the perturbation between H1 and H2 is very small. So even if the difference between these two operators, these two Hamiltonians, is very small, maybe, you know, exactly how small is depends on the situation, but, but somewhat small, then nevertheless this thing will decay because the chaos is telling you that if you sort of making a small, a small perturbation, you still get a big effect. Equivalently, if I define this time evolution to consist of first applying a simple operator and then evolving backwards in time, that would get me back just to the expectation value of the Heisenberg operator in some state. Another notion of echo can involve multiple operators. You could take a state psi and maybe apply some operator to it at time zero. Go forward in time, backwards in time with a different Hamiltonian. Look at some other operator A, repeat the same thing. this. This is the more general notion. You could recover the previous case as a special limit where I set B to the identity and set A equal psi psi. And this again has the same kind of flavor where I'm, I'm applying some perturbation, I'm going forward and backwards and I'm seeing how much the forward and backward perturbation fails to cancel if I insert some other operator here. And what's interesting about these, these, um, and so, you know, so, so for example, this is known in a certain limit, actually shown by Horacio Paskowski's in the audience, that if, say, H1 and H2 differ by a small perturbation, then indeed, this echo will decay at a rate set by the classical Lyapunov exponent. So there's a parameter regime where the decay of this quantity reflects some chaotic property of the classical system. And this is what um, Michael Berry has termed quantum chaology, which is sort of seeing the effects of classical chaos in the corresponding quantum system. So that's one sort of notion of chaos that you could have. Yeah. Um, I, I, the answer is I don't know and there may not be one. Or that's a sort of an open question. So that, that's, I think that's a, I mean, I, I don't mean to imply that Michael Berry didn't think about this, but like this is, this is a limitation of that view of quantum chaos, is that a system like the spin chain I have has no obvious classical limit. And so it's not clear what you would, you know, if this does decay, and it, it will decay in some way, suppose it decays exponentially, 
Can I interpret that exponent as a Lyapunov exponent? It's not clear. So that's sort of one of the questions you would, might want to answer about quantum chaos, which as far as I know is, is an open question for generic many-body systems. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So the question was, is there always a physical interpretation? And, um, well, I won't say always, but in many cases, yes. So these kind of correlation functions can actually be measured experimentally. And um, I'll talk more about this next time. But let me just mention now, in sort of very broad terms, how you might do measurements like this. And the idea is, well, let me put it this way. There, there, there are many, many tricks experimentalists can employ. But broadly speaking, you can think in terms of the ability to go forward and backward in time, the ability to control the system with some, some probes. So for example, imagine you have a system, which I draw as this line. So this is my system. And I have some probe, which may be just a single other a single other qubit, or like the reference I had in the last lecture. So this could be n qubits, and this might be one qubit. And let's say they're initially in a product state, so time runs this way. Well, then I could, for example, apply some interaction between my probe and the rest of the system. Interaction V then I could, say, evolve forward in time with some unitary U1, evolve backwards with some unitary U2 dagger, do nothing to the probe, and then interact them again in some way with another V, and measure, say, the probe. This is a general class of experiment that one could imagine doing. So again, let's say you imagine starting with some unentangled state of these two systems. You move forward in time. You entangle them in some way. Then you do some time to time evolution on just the system you care about. And then you apply another gate, another some kind of interaction, and you maybe measure the probe. You, you know, you could also measure the system. This is a, a broad class of observables. And so, for example, Suppose you prepare the system initially in a bell pair, like I did in the, previous, in the previous lecture. So I have my reference, my qubit, my probe here coupled to the system. Then I go forward in time. I go backward in time. And then let's say I measure observable A here, observable B on the probe. And then I do the time evolution again, like this. This is simply the expectation value of A tensor B in the state psi final, where psi final is obtained by evolving U2 dagger U1, tensor identity on EPR pair. Sorry, it can't be seen very well. So this is just saying, this is just the expectation value of operator A and operator B in a state psi final, which I obtain by evolving my initial state forward and backwards on just the system and do nothing to the probe. So what this requires the ability to do is to make a bell pair and to effectively, say, evolve your system forward and backwards in time with some effective Hamiltonian. So if you can do those things, then you can measure correlation functions like this. And so when I, when I talk on, on, on Saturday, tomorrow, about the experimental side of things, it'll be a bit about how you actually implement procedures like this in the lab in various contexts and what the limitations of those implementations are and what we can learn about the chaos we've been studying here. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, so, sorry. I mean, um, let, me, let me be clear. This is a sort of overly complicated version. I could also just evolve forward in time and measure how the correlations decay. That would sort of, that would be similar to measuring the decay of mutual information that I showed you in the previous lecture, right? The mutual information between, say, your first site and the reference upper bounds the correlations between the first site and the reference. And so seeing those correlations decay would be like taking this setup, not evolving backwards in time at all, just evolving forwards and measuring how the correlations decay. That would be a very simple experiment that you could do. Yeah, so, so what I'm trying, what I, what I was hoping to convey here is that this forward and backwards in time will give us access to this butterfly effect physics. So we didn't see this physics on the first day because everything was just kind of decaying to some uniform thermal value. But we, we want to see this sort of sensitivity of initial conditions, this growth of perturbations. And so this forward and backwards trick, if you like, is going to let us see that butterfly effect physics. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, okay, you can see uh, you start from this uh, position. Yeah. So if you say that uh, you go back to time, you, uh, you go to the same position. Mm -hmm. You continue say, with the. I mean, so why yeah, I'm you not sure I understand. <coughs> Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, oh, I see, I see what you're saying. You're, you're asking if I start in two distant places, I go backwards, I get to the same place. That's what you're asking, right? Or I, I sort of reverse this procedure. Yeah, so, so it's true. If you do this exactly right, if you go back exactly the same way you went and do exactly the same inverse perturbation and do that, you will return to the same place. But if you make a mistake, then you're going to go off again in a different location. So you need to do the reversal very precisely, and that's one of the problems in the experiment. That the experiment manifests the fact that... No, I, I, that no, I'm just saying that uh, if you uh, consider the, the, the evolution backward, yeah. when, when the points are very near, yeah. and, and then you continue to go backward, I think that the point... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. It's different in the case in which... Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, the, the, the zero value was like going far, like was going to late time. So if I went, went, went backwards in time to initial condition and then I kept going further backwards, you'd see it thermalizes again. So it, it, actually, it actually decays in the other direction as well. So this initial condition that I started with is very special. And so it actually would decay, so it sort of, you know, it, 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 it diverges this way but it also diverges in the opposite direction. Yeah. Is, is that? Okay, well, look, let's go a little further and then see if you, if you are happier. Any other questions? Yeah. So, like, someone could say, so we have V1, V2 dagger, they're unitary, so if I multiply them, it's just another unitary. So how is this any different from the experiment you described where you didn't have V2 dagger? And is it true that the reason is they're supposed to be unitary coming from local Hamiltonians and local Hamiltonians Correct, yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, U1 and U2 dagger are just unitaries, why not just combine them into a big unitary? And the answer offered by the questioner, which is the correct one, is that the, the, the point is that U1 and U2 are exponentials of local Hamiltonians. And furthermore, they differ only by a little bit. You know, if, if, if U1 has nothing to do with U2, then you won't be surprised if I tell you this is a small thing. But it also won't tell you anything about the physics of one system, because you're just multiplying two arbitrary unitaries together. So yeah, the, the crucial idea is that U1 and U2 are somehow closely related but slightly different. 
and that they're both local. And that's why it makes sense not to combine them into a single object, but to keep track of this small difference. Okay. So, um, so I talked about Heisenberg operator, operator growth, various notions of echo. Now I want to introduce um, the final piece, which is the notion of operator amplitudes and out of time order correlations. So given the Heisenberg operator, W of t, we can always expand it in a complete basis of operators, which I'll label like this, a sum over two strings of integers, a and b, uh, of some coefficient and some operator basis OAB. And what this basis is, one choice for it is the following. I multiply over all sites from 1 to n, sigma x on site R to the AR times sigma z on site R to the BR times the square root of minus 1 the AR, BR. So in this formulation, it should be clear that A and B are both, um, let's see, A and B are in the set of strings of 0 and 1 of length n. So in other words, A is an n-bit string, B is an n-bit string. A tells me whether I have a poly X matrix on site R, and B tells me whether I have a poly Z matrix on site R. And since you can make poly Y from X and Z by multiplying them, this will give you every possible combination of poly matrices. So this is a, this is a complete basis for the operator. And this, I can therefore expand, let's suppose this W is initially a single spin. I can expand that operator as a function of time in a basis of the complete set of operators. So this is the complete basis. And in terms of this complete basis, an intuitive meaning of operator growth is the following. Initially, at time zero, if, if W is a single spin, then that means all of these coefficients C are zero except for one. There's only one C that's non-zero, and that's the C corresponding to the particular O which is equal to W, right? However, as time evolves, this operator will become more complicated. You know, remember, it's conjugation by the time evolution, and that's chaotic. And so as time evolves, the number of non-zero coefficients here will grow. And the growth of that number of non-zero coefficients and the distribution of them and their structure is how you can characterize operator growth at a microscopic level. But just like, you know, you don't usually diagnose the system, the physics of a system by looking at the amplitudes of every possible configuration, this is generally, the complete set of all these coefficients is generally too much information to make sense of. So we want to reduce it to some simpler observable. And, you know, what we want to capture is the spatial spread of entanglement and information. That's what we saw last time. So imagine I have an operator W, which is, say, sigma 1 x. And as a function of time, this operator will spread over the system. So at some time t, maybe W of t has support on all of these sites, approximately. And at some later time, it has support on even more sites, and so on. And so a useful way to characterize how uh, large the support of W is, is to look 
And this also kind of makes sense from the classical chaos point of view, is to look at the commutator between W and some other operator V, which is located, say, at position R. So here is V. Let's say it's equal to sigma R. So think of V as like a probe. I move V around. I test to see whether it commutes with the Heisenberg operator. And if it commutes, well, then the operator probably hasn't hit, hasn't expanded to that point yet. And if it doesn't commute, then the operator probably has expanded to that point. Okay. So And so the first thing you can say, well, let's just look at the expectation value of this commutator as a measure of how big the operator is. So guess one is to say, let's look at C1 equals the expectation value in some state of this operator. Okay, that's a, that's a good idea, except it has, a, it has a problem. This quantity has a physical interpretation. It's the linear response of the system to a perturbation at time zero. So imagine I perturb the system at time zero with operator V, and I ask what the expectation value of operator W is at some later time T. This gives the linear response answer to that question. But in a chaotic system, if you ping the system, because it loses memory of its initial condition, it's not going to know, after a very short amount of time, what you did, what kind of ping you made. And so what that means is that C1 typically decays rapidly. So if I want to know at what time the operator W of T has spread to a site, you know, to a, a hundred sites away, I could try to use the commutator to diagnose that, but what you'll find is that's just basically zero long before the operator would have reached that point. And mathematically, that decay is happening because this is a, this operator has positive and negative eigenvalues, and it kind of can average out and give you zero. So the next thing you might look at is to look at the variance of this object. If I tell you the, the first moment is zero, let's look at the second moment as a way to characterize. And this will be a central object of study. It's the expectation value of the commutator squared. Yeah. Oh, oh, I was just saying, I, I, was, I, was, I motivated the, the, the commutator as an operator as a measure of um, how, how spread out the operator W is. And I said, okay, we have an operator. Let's try to turn it into some correlation function that we can measure. The simplest correlation function you could imagine is to just take the expectation value of that operator. That's what this is. Oh, the, the, um, because the, the product... Um, the product can be non-zero even if the operator hasn't spread. It just measures correlation, right? So suppose I start with a state in which W and V are correlated. Then that, that will have a non-zero expectation value even at zero time, but the operator W has not spread there. So I'm trying to sort of, I'm trying to look at the dynamics as opposed just to the correlations in the system. Another motivation for thinking about the commutator is the commutator gives you the Poisson bracket, classically, and that's how you see the butterfly effect there. So there's sort of different points of view on why this is a natural object to consider. Another motivation comes from looking at this expression. If you want to essentially commute this past that, you're going to have, if you can do that, then you're going to get no decay for the echo. And if you can't do that, you'll get a decay. So somehow the echo is also about the inability to commute perturbed time evolution through other operators. And just for simplicity, I'll say suppose W and V are unitary. 
if I take, take, if I take them to be spin operators, they're Hermitian and unitary. They're very special. But just suppose they're unitary. Then the C2 can be written as 2 minus 2 times the real part of F, or F is the now infamous out of time order correlation function. out of time order correlation function. So let, me, let me go over here. Yeah. So in this picture, if you just want to see, you know, when this uh, double, uh, the operator W is like propagating in this direction to see it commit with, with V, and like uh, by calculating this uh, C two, it seems to me you know, either like it, this one hasn't propagated and so it just commute, and when this one already passed this point, like it just you know like uh, like it, it wouldn't change significantly. So you, you just get you know this kind of you know step function kind of thing. That's right. Yeah. So so let, let's so. So yeah, let, let's indeed understand the basic behaviors of this f. So f at t small, say compared to the separation between the operators, they approximately commute. That means I can move v and w past each other. Then I get w dagger w, v dagger v, I get identity. Now on the other hand, when time is large, well then, let's suppose that these operator coefficients here are sort of all generically non-zero and have roughly the same value. That seems like a plausible assumption in a chaotic system. Then if V is, if this operator V here is, say, a single poly operator, then exactly half of these O's commute with V and exactly half of them anti-commute with V. So I can expand this thing out. Let's suppose I'm doing the infinite temperature case, which is what I've been doing. You expand out W like this. Trace rho infinity, sum over A, B, C, W, T, O, A, B, V, Right? Then half of these commute, half of them anti-commute. So for half of the terms, I can move the V through the O for free. And for the other half of the terms, I get a minus 1. Then the Vs will annihilate either way. So I have a bunch of terms, a bunch of terms with a plus sign and then minus a bunch of minus terms. Yeah, I write it like this so it's clear. The absolute value of the plus terms minus the absolute value of the minus terms. The number of such terms is roughly equal if these C's are sort of equally distributed. And so what you find is that you would get approximately zero because you're just adding and subtracting approximately the same number of pluses and minuses. So there'll be some fluctuation, of course, but it's roughly zero. And so indeed, the simple picture in a chaotic system is roughly speaking that as a function of time, sorry, for some fixed time, and as a function of separation r, this function f will look like that. So for operators that are farther separated than the time it's taken for the operator to expand, so for distantly separated operators, um, sorry, this is the opposite. Hold on, I'm getting myself confused. You have to be really careful. It depends on whether you plot C or F. They're sort of opposites. Um, 
let's plot C, then it's correct. <laughs> so for operators that are very far separated, the commutator is zero. But for operators that are closer than some ballistically expanding cone, the commutator is non-zero and it's approximately two. All right, that comes from saying that the commutator is two minus twice the real part. If that's zero, then it's just about two. So this value of two is just what you get as a late time value of the commutator for poly matrices in the spin chain. Okay. Any questions about that? So now I want to go and show you um, how this looks in the spin chain we've been studying. And then I'll show you also how the same as variable looks in a non-local model, where there's no spatial locality, but still a few body physics. <laughs> ah, yeah, so uh, first, an announcement. Um, if you go to this website um, right now, you will find nothing. But um, <laughs> in a few days, you will find lecture notes and the numerical demos that I showed you. And um, I'm going to post these to the archive eventually, within a couple of weeks. So if you see any typos, omissions, gross errors, et cetera, um, please email me and I will fix them and acknowledge you. So you can make your own mark on quantum chaos. Yeah, so here's the picture I had before of the Heisenberg operator as a kind of butterfly effect. And so this is where I told you that the linear response typically decays due to chaos, due to the loss of memory of initial condition but that the operator growth can be effectively measured by looking at the square commutator. Okay, so here's what this thing looks like um, for a small spin chain. The, the size doesn't matter too much here, but you, you can make it much bigger. So you see a picture that's not unlike what I drew on the board, although there's some initial sort of drop here. The out of time order correlator here is between an operator on site one and another operator on some other site, which is labeled by the different colors in this plot. So this is putting the operator V on site two, on site three, on site four, up to site seven. Okay. And you see that on site two, the out of time order correlator starts to decay quickly. It has some oscillation, then it approaches the value zero after some time. That indicates that the operator on site one immediately starts spreading to site two. And similarly, operator on site two, it takes a little bit longer to expand to site two, but it, it too starts to decay, has an oscillation, then it approaches zero. And similarly, on site three, it takes a little bit longer to decay, but eventually it does. On site four, a little bit longer. And the fact that these curves are equally spaced approximately means that the expansion of the operator, W of T, is <coughs> ballistic. If I increase time by one unit, it expands by a fixed amount in space. Yeah, there's a question. So I think what you drew on the board was uh, fixed T and a function of R. Is yeah. Is yeah, right? that's right. Okay, so, so now you're looking at something else. So th this, is, this, is, this is the right plot. So if you, if, it's just that the commutator is one minus that. So if I change space and time, then, yeah, sorry, I, I got a little confused. But th this is a correct, a correct figure. Right. Basically, you know, when it's one, it means they commute. So, you know, the operator on site seven and the operator on site one commute effectively for a long time. Okay. And now, since we motivated this by talking about the butterfly effect, you may ask, you know, is there any exponential growth here? Okay, so let's look actually now at early time. Now, I take the same object the same dynamic range. And instead of looking at f, I plot 1 minus f, which is essentially the commutator. I take the log, and I plot you know, the log of that quantity versus time. And so you, again, you see the equally spaced lines. But actually, over about, I guess this is log base e. So over 12 e-folds, or 10 e-folds, you have actually regions of pretty linear growth on this log linear plot. Yeah, it's not bad. So this is what you find in ADS CFT for spatially separated operators. It's what you find in coupled clusters of SYK. 
And you might have thought that was the generic behavior. And here I showed you a spin chain where indeed it has some kind of exponential growth at early time. So maybe this is a way to define a Lyapunov exponent for a general quantum system without any semi-classical limit. However, the trouble is um, I'm misleading you terribly with this figure because this behavior is very non-generic. So if you turn off this power law interaction, this goes away. And the reason why I study this spin chain is actually, I, I discovered this some years ago. This is essentially the only spin chain I know of where you actually see purely exponential growth at early time. Every other spin chain on small size systems doesn't have this physics. This is at infinite temperature. Actually, this is probably in a random initial state. So that mimics the trace over a thermal state. So I want to make a little aside. Oh, yeah, let me comment on. And so the idea, you know, this, 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 this rate of growth here, we, if it was generic, if it appeared in every system, which is kind of what we were expecting originally, then that would maybe define a notion of the Apanov exponent. And then you have the Maldesena Schenker Stanford bound, which says that this particular quantity, which is not quite at a time order correlator, at least not at finite temperature, it's some thermally regulated version of that. This quantity obeys some kind of bound in its growth. It can't grow faster than exponentially. And the exponent can't be bigger than 2 pi t. So at infinite temperature, there's no bound. But at finite temperature, there is a bound. And so the idea is maybe this is how to define the Lyapunov exponent quantum mechanically. And then that object would satisfy this nice bound. Because in a local spin chain, you always have a huge separation of time scales between decay and scrambling. So now I want to make a little aside, just because I've been obsessed about this subject for the last year or two, about operator growth. I want to show you that we can actually use some tensor network trick, study operator growth in very large spin chains, and we find something very unexpected. So this is some work that should be finished soon with Sheng Long Chu, my postdoc at Maryland. So now I'm going to study the same model, except I'm going to change L0 to 1, so it becomes strictly nearest neighbor. And I'm going to um, just turn this Z field into 0.5, so it doesn't oscillate anymore. It's just a uniform field. So it's just a slight variant of the previous model. And the idea of the calculation is that we want to approximate the Heisenberg operator with a matrix product operator. That is, we want to approximate as a low entanglement operator. And the idea is here's some sort of ballistic light cone showing the expansion of an operator V located, an operator W located at site 50. That operator expands in space. This is a plot of the commutator. Commutator, or the log of the commutator. Commutator is essentially zero here, and it's very non-zero there. And the idea of this expansion is that actually this expansion will be good far out in front of the wave. Because that's where the commutator is approximately zero. That means the Heisenberg operator is approximately the identity operator out there, and that means there's no entanglement. So although we can't generally solve the dynamics of a complicated thermalizing system, we can actually study the operator growth at early time using this kind of technique. So this is to show you that it works for a small size system using a very small bond dimension. This is bond dimension four. For a free system, which is integrable, you can actually essentially go to arbitrary time and recover the dynamics exactly because you're never generating a lot of entanglement. However, even for an interacting system, you can go, you can capture all the early time part, you can capture the decay, and you can actually get quite far into the sort of late time region before you start to deviate away from the exact value. And you see, this is the out of time order correlator for that nearest neighbor Heising model. And you see, it, you know, it doesn't have that, that second, that first dip, but otherwise it looks quite similar to the, the value, the, the, the behavior for the Tower Law model. However, what we can do is look for very large spin chains now, say 100 sites, to try to see if what we saw before was just some artifact of finite size or really something physical. And here I show you now the log of the commutator over some enormous dynamic range as a function of time for different positions of operators. So this is where I put the operator W at site 50, actually site 51 of 101 site chain, and I study the way the commutator changes as I move the other operator V around. So the first thing you see is it's not, it's not a straight line. There's substantial curvature even for, for 100 sites, which is somewhat surprising. 
However, we can find a slightly modified form where there's a sort of chaotic growth and also something which looks like diffusion, some sort of mixed growth and diffusion, which actually will collapse the data very well at this size. So, okay, maybe, maybe there's a spectrum of Lapinov exponents. Maybe I need to, like, maybe somehow I, like, that, that spectrum is important and that complicates the story. You know, maybe that's right. But actually, you can go to even larger sizes. You can go to, say, 200 sites. And what you find there is actually pretty interesting. You find that there's actually a two-stage growth process. There's some kind of initial chaos wave which comes out. And that's what we were seeing in the small size numerics. That wave comes out, it has a high velocity, but then it decays again after some time. And then after that, there's a more sustained secondary chaos wave, which emerges. And that wave seems to propagate with a smaller velocity, but to propagate in a sustained way. And now, if you really push the numerics, you can try to zoom in on the log of the commutator of that region. And now it looks like over a relatively small dynamic range, you have approximately linear growth on this log linear scale. So maybe there actually is an exponent, but you have to go to a relatively large system size to see it. We're not sure. These different colored lines are different bond dimensions, and these different bond dimensions are not agreeing with each other perfectly on this, on this scale, so we know we haven't converged in bond dimension. So we need to go to a higher bond dimension. But nevertheless, there's something, something definitely happening you know, this is a log plot, so here it's essentially converged, and it's only after this hump that things start to get kind of funny. Question? Yeah? On the previous slide, at early times, you seem to have several white cones propagating upwards. Yeah. Have... That's right. There seems to be several for your temporal. Oh, you mean like sort of in here? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's kind of like this hump here is kind of moving and dispersing. So I, I think that that this, this sort of different rays correspond to these different humps that are moving out in some way. So we don't understand the physics of this at all. We're still trying to understand it. But it seems like, um, and it's also sensitive to the Trotter step. So you can actually consider like a pulse model where you apply one term, then the other term, then one term, then the other term. And where this divergence happens depends on that Trotter step. So there's some kind of very surprising and rich structure of the spatial growth of chaos, even in these simple spin chains. And it seems hard to access with these small size numerics, and so this is the kind of thing that you would like to have an experiment to give you insight into. Okay. So that's just a little taste of like the um, cutting edge research from two weeks in the future. So now let me tell you, uh, let's go back to our sort of main story, and I'll tell you how out of time order correlators are related, again, to some information theoretic notion in the spin chain. That's sort of our theme, is that it's all about the way information is spreading. So let's go back to the spin chain. I'm going to restore my L0 equals 5 and my, my um, funny oscillating field, just, just for consistency. And now I want to consider a variant of the protocol I showed you on the first lecture, which was where I entangle a reference from my system and look at the mutual information. This is called the hayden preskill protocol, and what it says is let, let's, we still have the reference, and the reference is still entangled at time zero with the system. But now I also add a memory, where, which is entangled maximally with the other sites of the system. So if you like, imagine these other sites are in a maximally mixed state, and I'm simply keeping the purification of that maximally mixed state off to the side somewhere. And neither the reference nor the memory evolve in time. The time evolution only acts on the system itself. And so now I want to ask, where is the entanglement with the reference and all this stuff up here? That's the question we're going to ask again. And remember, the answer to this question, if, if this mutual information over 2 is approximately 1, then that means you can distill the entanglement with the reference in that set of degrees of freedom. Okay. So let's look first at, uh, well, so let's make a few general comments first. So, so the reference is never directly entangled with the memory. The mutual information between the reference and the memory is always identically 0. 
because their initial state is uncorrelated and the time evolution does not act between them. So there's no correlation whatsoever. Okay, so you might think having the memory doesn't help you very much. Why would that be useful if it's not correlated with this reference? Okay, so but, but anyways, let's press ahead and, and ask the question, what happens if I look at the mutual information between the reference and one site plus the memory? So this is like saying, suppose I know the initial state and I have a single site in my system, what can I do? Can I get entanglement out? All right, so the black curve is the out of time order correlator. Well, actually, one minus it now. These colored curves are the mutual information as a function of time. Actually, one half the mutual information. And so you see, like we saw before, on site one, the mutual information starts out at two. The mutual information over two is one. It decays a little bit, but actually it stays at a you know, sizable value as a function of time. Now, furthermore, if I look at site two, its mutual information doesn't decay, it actually rises substantially and then approaches the same late time value as on site one. And the same with site three and site four and site five. Those all also increase. So what this means is that actually the mutual information between a single site and the memory with the reference is actually substantial for any site you choose. Once the information has propagated to that site. And how we measure that information propagation, well, I'm showing you the out of time order correlators, you'll see that they happen in lockstep with the growth of this mutual information. And so the out of time order correlator is really providing you a measure of the way information is growing. It's giving you a, a, an operational, or not, not an operational, uh, a correlation function measure which reproduces this entropic physics of this state. Now, let me show you just another example. Let me show you two sites plus memory. So now I'm showing you the mutual information between site X and X plus one plus the memory with the reference. And now, okay, I start for sites one and two. It starts at one, decays a little bit, but actually stays quite high. Sites two and three grow, approach the same value, and so on. So actually any two sites, in fact, they don't even have to be contiguous. I can make them sites one and five. You could do the same thing. You can use the code I provide and check for yourself. Any two sites will have this very high mutual information. If I did three sites, it would be even higher. And so what this is telling you, this is a sort of very strong sense in which the information is spread everywhere. It's everywhere and nowhere. Because if I don't have the memory, then I can't recover anything. We saw that on the previous day. The mutual information is just zero at late time. But if I have the memory, if I sort of know the initial state, then the mutual information is high. And this is like, again, sort of like the butterfly effect. If I keep track of where I started and compare things, then I can see this growth of chaos. Okay, so this is what Juan was talking about this morning in terms of once this mutual information is high, then Hayden Preskill says you can distill this bell pair and you can get your entanglement out. And that's what, what he was talking about this morning. Okay, any questions about that? And you see the essential point was that there's a, a ballistic spreading of information and that more of that information is not just growing in space, but becoming more complicated. And so in this, this spreading of information is what we call scrambling. And so you see the time scale for scrambling in this linear chain is proportional to the linear system size. And so that's gonna be a general feature of any local model. The time scale is scramble over some set of degrees of freedom will grow like a linear size of that set of degrees of freedom. But now I want to contrast this with another model, which is a non-local model, um, to give you a sense of the difference of time scales. Uh, this model is similar to the previous one, but, but has some essential differences. The first is, so there's only two kinds of terms. The first kind of term is a spin-spin interaction. And there's an interaction term for every component of the spin. So there's an XX, there's a YY, and there's a ZZ interaction. And each of those interactions comes with a different coupling 
J R R prime alpha, and it, that coupling affects every pair of spins. So I can choose these couplings however I want. One interesting choice is to choose them randomly. So this is this is sort of a different different. Um, this is this is like the 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 disordered couplings in the S Y K model. So suppose, for example, I choose those couplings to be, I don't know, there shouldn't be a two here. The coupling is distributed according to a uniform distribution from minus 0.5 to 0.5 with this scaling factor of j over the square root of the number of units. And I take j to be one, just like before. And this scaling with one over square root of n is chosen so that the model has a nice thermodynamic limit, so the energy is extensive with n. Because intuitively, if, if every spin interacts with a better spin strongly, then the energy should scale like n squared, and that's too high. You, don't, you want the energy to scale extensively with n, so you need to make these couplings small. And then I also add uh, a uniform additional field in the x direction, so I'm keeping that term around. And I'm going to give it some value 2.5. Actually, if you make this, this gamma small, so you make the gamma very large, then this is just going to polarize everything in the x direction. If you make it very small, then you have some kind of model which is sometimes used to describe glasses. Because you have lots of competing interactions that want the spins to align in various ways. And so depending on which configuration happens to be the most favorable, you may get some, some large number of low energy states. So I'm just going to call this the non-local spin model. So let's look at out of time order correlators in this model. So here's um, for a single random realization disorder, no averaging whatsoever. Just picked all the coefficients randomly. When you run the code, it'll pick a different random set. Well, actually, MATLAB uses the same random seed unless you tell it to do something different. So you might actually get the same. <laughs> you might actually get the same set. Anyways, um, you see that for all different sites now, there's variation, but they kind of all decaying on the same time scale. And that's because you have this all-to-all -all physics. So everyone's treated equally. It's a very egalitarian society. So that's very nice. And there's still the same basic structure. Things start out at one. They decay down to approximately zero. But the decay is happening on the same time scale for all the different sites. And there's not an obvious sort of long time that's happening here. There's no stretching. It's not, not easily visible. Now, I can also look at the site average out of time order correlator. That has a kind of nicer form. And for comparison, I'm going to show you also the expectation value of just sigma z on site 1 and sigma z on site 1 at time t, so just an ordinary autocorrelation function. So you see, okay, this thing oscillates and then decays. And maybe the out of time order correlator takes a little bit longer to decay, but, but not much longer for these small sizes. So in particular, if we expect some separation of time scales to occur in the large n limit, the large limit of many spins, it's hard to see that here. We can look at early time and, and zoom in, and maybe we see a hint of exponential growth. So here I just plot log of 1 minus the average, the site average OTOC. And you see, okay, there's a little region for two e-folds or so where it looks pretty flat. But it's hard to say what's going on. It's hard to understand what the time scale of scrambling is in this model. Does it happen in time of order one? Does that time grow with system size in any way? So a way, I'll show you now one last model, um, which lets us elucidate the physics of this time scale in a large size limit, but which is different from SYK, just to show you something different. And that model is called the Brownian circuit model. So this is very much like the previous model. It has spin-spin couplings and it has single spin terms. Now the coefficients are all random and those coefficients depend on time. So I'm adding one new crucial physical ingredient here which is that the coefficients are time-dependent functions. So this describes a system coupled to a noisy environment which is causing all of the couplings to fluctuate as a function of time. So in particular, this Hamiltonian depends on time, and there's no conserved energy. And I'm going to draw your attention to a notational change. These sigma tildes 
with the mu nu superscript now denotes all the original plot matrices and also the identity. So every combination of terms appears here. Identity, identity, identity x, identity y, identity z, x, y, x, z, et cetera. And so physically, if you want to think about how you would instantiate this, just think about making a little time index, a little time window delta t. And for every time window, you pick a random set of couplings, and then you evolve for a delta t. Then in the next time step, you pick a new set of random couplings, and you evolve again. And then the next window, you pick a new set, and you evolve again. And at the end of the day, we can consider averaging physical quantities over the different choices of parameters in this model. And so this model is nice in the same way that the disorder averaging in SYK helps you compute things. So too here, disorder averaging, or really fluctuation averaging, will, will help us compute and give us analytical access to the physics at large size. And this model goes back to a nice paper by Neiman Lashkari and friends um, where they studied the way that entanglement grows in this, in this model as a model of scrambling. So here we're going to use it to study operator growth. So recall, again, my formula here. Uh, this is the basis of operators that I introduced to you before. It's still a basis of operators for the non-local system. It's just a kinematic statement. This is the formula for the operator coefficients for some general Heisenberg operator W of t. And so as before, let's imagine that W at time zero is just a single spin flip or a single poly z, something like that. And let, let's time evolve with respect to this random time-dependent Hamiltonian. And let's say, look at these operator amplitudes. Let's square them to get some probabilities. And let's average those probabilities over the different realizations of the random circuit. So we're studying how the operator grows on average in this random Hamiltonian model. Okay. And the really nice thing about this model is that you can actually derive a closed set of equations for these averaged operator weights. And to do that, I won't really show you the details, which you can find in the notes, but I'll explain the basic physics. The, the point is that the, the, the ensemble averaged operator weight for operator labeled by A and B depends only on the total weight of that operator. And what the weight means is how many out of the total n possible slots have a non-trivial polymatrix in them. So poly x, tensor identity, 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 identity has weight 1. Poly x times poly y on site 2 has a weight 2, and so forth. So the weight is just given by the maximum of A and B on every site, summed over all sites. And so whereas this is like the probability that operator W if I measured it in this operator basis, would give you O. I can also compute the probability, called H tilde of W, that I just measure some total weight W. So I marginalize the sum over all operator choices which have total weight W. The number of those choices is N choose W. That's the number of places to place a non-trivial poly operator. And then I raise it to 3 to the W, because that's how many choices I have on each site. And so this quantity H tilde, if I sum over all weights, the weight can run from 0 up to n, because I can have no poly operators, or I can have n poly operators. And it's a normalized probability distribution. So this is a nice model, because I can derive an equation for these operator weights. But also, they are a much easier way to visualize the way the operator is changing in the whole space, because I've reduced a lot of the amplitudes to the same number. So everything depends just on the total weight. Are there any questions about, about this, this um, setup? Okay. So as I said, you can use um, that random Hamiltonian setup. I won't explain how um, here, but it's in the notes, which will appear in the future. You can derive a closed system of equations for these operator weights, h tilde of w. Okay, and here they are. The time derivative of the probability of weight w is given by some term involving weight w 
some term involving weight W plus 1 and some term involving weight W minus 1. And this is sort of makes physical sense. If you, the Hamiltonian is conjugating your operator, then you're going to have a probability of adding an operator or removing an operator or maybe doing nothing. Okay. So there's three kinds of terms, and this is, this is essentially a set of rate equations that you can solve. And we can already actually get some sense of the physics of these equations by taking a, a sort of continuum limit where we take the weight, which remember can run from 0 to n, we divide it by n, and we define a new variable x, which lives in 0 to 1, which is sort of like a continuous, uh, if, you, if weight's a discrete thing from 0 to n, this is like uh, the continuum description of that weight. So weight n corresponds to x equals 1, and weight 0 corresponds to x equals 0. And very, rather remarkably, if you assume that this h tilde function varies smoothly from weight w to weight w plus 1, if it has a good derivative expansion, then you can derive a very beautiful um, sort of wave equation for the way that the weight changes as a function of the change in x. And recall that small x, that's corresponding to weight which is close to zero. So if my initial operator is a single poly, it has a weight one. So I'm starting with an initial condition that's localized near weight zero, which is near x equals zero. So let me neglect this term here. That's going to be approximately zero. Then I have the time derivative of h is equal to minus three times x dx acting on h. If I define a new variable, which is just log x, then I get a wave equation, a chiral wave equation in t minus log x. So what that tells you is that this thing is going to grow exponentially in weight space with uh, a rate given by this number, 3. So we explicitly see a exponential growth coming out of the physics here. Okay. And so if in particular I start with, you know, um, amplitude of 1 on site 1, the time it will take me to reach site x is going to be like log n. So site x equals 1. Okay, now we can also just simulate these equations directly on our computer very easily to see what the whole behavior is like. And so what I'm showing here now is that weight distribution function as a function of weight here and time here in the space time. So let's look now at time zero. That's this first column. Everything's localized on weight one. Right, that's starting out with my initial single poly operator. And now as time evolves, that weight on site one, the probability to be in weight one decreases. But the probability to have higher weight increases. So the operator starts spreading out. And you see during the peak of scrambling, actually, the operator is actually, if you look now as a function at a fixed time, the operator is spread over a substantial part of the weight space. So it has substantial probability to be found in, in any weight from zero to about three quarters of the total possible weight. So this is the process of scrambling right here. This is where the operator is spreading over the entire system, it's becoming very delocalized. And then what's happening here at late time is I'm getting a concentration of measure phenomenon. At late time, the probability for any given site to have a poly operator should be three quarters, right? Because I have either identity x, y, or z. They should all be equal probable. So the average weight should be three quarters. So if this is n equals 40, that's three quarters would be 30. That's the peak of this thing. And the variance is saying that I have some square root and kind of variance or, or center deviation for the width of this peak. So again, the picture is the operator starts localized on low weight. It spreads over the whole system. That's scrambling. And then reconcentrates at late time in some kind of sort of thermalized distribution. And because I've averaged over circuits here, this is really thermal. There's no remembrance of the initial condition here. In principle, it would eventually recur 
But in this model, this is an attractor. It'll just stay at this late time fixed point for all time. So this is what thermalization looks like from this optical perspective. Sorry? Oh, it's just a fixed point of this. It's a stable fixed point of this, um, like, essentially Markovian evolution. And so from which property of the system depends the, the position and the weight of the final time, of the late time weight? Yeah, so, so the, the, the value here, the fact that it's 30, is the fact that there are, there are four choices of operator. Identity X, Y, or Z, and they're all equal probable. So the probability that so so in other words, you have your Heisenberg operator, you're expanding it out at a very late time, looking at a single site and asking what's the probability on that site that it's identity, that it's X, that it's Y, or that it's Z. The probability is equal for all those possibilities, but three of them have weight one and one has weight zero, so the average weight should be three quarters. And so the average number of operators that the, the average number of slots in the state, in the operator, which have a non-trivial poly, is about three quarters. And so the average weight should be about 30. And do you think this will work gener generically if you, you have tried more complicated cases? Yeah, so, so, so what's nice here is that every operator is treated symmetrically. So there's sort of no preferred direction. But yeah, in, in a model like this Ising model that I showed you, where there's not, not a lot of symmetry or anything, like sort of everything's kind of generic, I think, yeah, that it should be pretty close to, to, um, to, what, to what you find here. Yeah. Other questions? OK. So you can also actually um, write down analytically what the out of time order correlator is in this model. And it turns out to be just related to the average weight as a function of time divided by n. So the out of time order correlator turns out to be 1 minus 4 thirds times the average weight over n. And so here I plot that as a function of time for different system sizes where I've doubled the size of the system at every step. So uh, my, initial, my initial curve is system size 40, that's here. Then my next one is system size 80, then 160, 320, and so on. And you see that the time scale for scrambling to happen, the time scale for the out of time order correlator to decay is going out by a fixed amount when I double the size of the system. So this is exposing very clearly that, that the time scale for scrambling this non-local model is logarithmic in the total system size. Whereas for the local model, it was linear. Here, it's logarithmic. And you see that because every time you double the system, the scrambling time gets one unit longer. So this is, I think, the simplest model I know of where you can see the logarithmic growth of chaos. I mean, the sort of logarithmic time scale for scrambling in a non-local spin model. And the final thing I want to show you is the variance of the weight as a function of time. And I've normalized, so here's the, the average value of the weight squared minus the average value of the weight quantity squared. And I normalize that not by n, but by n squared. So if I did this for a Gaussian, a, a sum of a bunch of random variables, this would actually go to zero. Because I divided by n squared, not just n. However, you see, as a function of system size, you know, we can do much larger sizes here, like 1,000 1, spins is very easy. It's just, just solving a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix in your computer. It's not a problem. As a function of system size, there's a peak in the variance around the scrambling time, right, when this thing is spreading the most. And that peak is going down, but it looks like it's essentially saturating at some finite value of the thermodynamic. And that's related to this fact that the operator has to spread over the entire set of weights here before it can recollimate at around weight, average weight three quarters of n. And here, because I've done this normalization with one over n squared, 
the operator variance drops to zero at late time, normalized in this way. Because it's a Gaussian at late time, for the Gaussian, the variance would be just n. And so when I normalize by 1 over n squared, I get something which goes to zero. So, what I told you today is about how operators grow and become more complex in both local and non-local spin chains. I try to give you a sense of how people want to define the Alpinov exponents in terms of the growth of out of time order correlators. We saw some evidence for that growth in these finite size simulations. But it was hard to see, especially in the non-local case, to get any dynamic range. And the local case, there are all kinds of complications we don't understand arising from the spatial propagation of chaos. However, if you go to this model and you look and you zoom in here, you plot the log of that at early time, it looks perfectly exponentially growing. So this Brownian circuit does indeed have exponential growth of chaos in this sense. And that's, you know, maybe not so surprising. It's not even a Hamiltonian system anymore. It's, a, it's sort of just completely, you know, it's not coupling to an environment, but you're averaging over randomness. And so you get a very clean signal of chaos. And you see the time scales for these things to happen grow with either the system size or the logarithm of the system size. And so next time what we'll talk about is much longer time scales. So once the scrambling is set in, once the information is spread everywhere, what happens next? What's the system doing and how do I characterize that later time dynamics? And this is where finally random matrix theory will come in. And we will look at the distribution of the level spacings of these different models. We'll understand whether locality versus non-locality has any effect at late time. And we'll also learn a little bit about so-called spectral form factor and eigenstate thermalization. So these are all kind of very late time physics. And then we'll wrap up with a discussion of experiments. And now experiments are nowhere near able to probe exponentially long times without having irreversible decoherence. So we'll talk about what experiments can do, what experiments have been done already, and what may be coming down the road in the near term in the lab that you might want to think about and get involved with. Okay, so thanks.